My name is Claire Finkelstein, and I am the founder of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law and its faculty director, as well as a professor here at University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School for the Paul G. Haga Jr. Lecture in Law, Government, and Public Policy. As some of you may know, Paul is the chair of the executive board of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law. And this lecture comes at the conclusion of Searle's conference uh, called National Security is a Feminist Issue, 20 Years of Women, Peace, and Security. We've had a very interesting afternoon uh, listening to fascinating panelists on that topic. Um, I'm very grateful to the Penn Law Office of International Programs for its help and support with this program. And Rangita Shihir, who is our uh, Associate Dean for International Affairs, uh, as well as to our own fellow, Xander Mice, who has led our, our efforts on this, uh, uh, who is Senior Fellow at Searle this year. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for all you've done. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Ms. Michelle Flournoy to deliver this distinguished lecture. She follows a long list of esteemed guests for the Hagel Lecture, including General Michael Hayden, General H.R. McMaster, Michael Chertoff, and Michael Beschloff. Uh, and unlike most of our other speakers, her name is not Michael. <laughs> um, I will, I will, close, right? I will introduce her formally in a moment, but before I do, um, I just want to take a moment to thank and to recognize Heather Haga. Uh, the Haga lecture would not have been possible without the thoughtfulness and generosity of Paul Haga's wife, Heather. Heather is an accomplished artist and has decades of experience in nonprofit board leadership. She serves on the board of trustees of her alma mater, Vassar College. She's chair of the Salzburg Global Seminar still, or almost, uh, maybe it just stopped, uh, among many other boards. And of course, she's part of the Penn Law family and of the Searle family. So I'm really delighted to welcome Heather Haga here to say a few words. Claire asked me to share with you the genesis of, of the gift, the lecture. And it was 2012, Paul was chair of Penn Law School, the board of advisors, and um, he had gone to Penn, he loves Penn, he loves his place, everything about it. And it was the run up to Christmas, and there are only so many ties you can buy for guys. So I thought, gee, wouldn't it be creative to think about doing something at Penn? So I called Mike Fitz, the, whom this auditorium is named after, the dean of the law school, and he said, oh, we really need a lecture. <laughs> and so we um, crafted this idea based in part on the fact that Paul had done public service after Penn Law School at the Securities Exchange Commission, that a lecture would be given once a year that would focus on encouraging young people, law students, graduate students, any kind of students, to go into public service because when we were young, being a public servant really was a respected and, and vaunted um, um, occupation. So over the years, we've noticed that fewer and fewer people are going into public service and more going to Wall Street and different things. And so we thought if there could be a possibility of inspiring someone on a day like this to consider um, public service for a couple years or maybe your whole career, um, it would be worthy of a lecture. So that is the genesis. And so we're very, very pleased to have Michelle here today um, as one of our uh, venerable and lovely lecturers for the Hague Lecture. So thank you. Claire, you can hear some Michelle. I want to say it's a particular honor to be able to uh, share the stage, as it were, with the Hague Lecture. The Hague Lecture is not formally linked to Searle, but because uh, Paul is, is Searle's executive board chair. Um, uh, we are really honored to be able to combine Searle events with the Hague Lecture, as we've been able to do several years running. Uh, and the purpose of the lecture series uh, to bring more young people into uh, public life and public policy work uh, is very much the goal of Searle, with the emphasis that we really seek to uh, bring more law students uh, and those interested in policy into public life with a strong foundation in ethics and the rule of law. 
we think it's one of the most important things that any law school can be doing is educating uh, young people in how to serve their country uh, honorably uh, and with a great understanding of what it means to serve within the bounds of law. Uh, so we seek to do that and uh, we're delighted that you are able to join us in, that, uh, in those efforts. Uh, I will now introduce Michelle Flournoy. Um, Michelle is the co-founder and managing partner of Westec Advisor, Advisors and formerly co-founder and chief executive officer of the Center for a New American Security, CNAS, where she currently serves on the board. She served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy from February 2009 to February 2012. When the U.S. Senate confirmed her nomination on February 9, 2009, she was at the time the highest ranking woman at the Pentagon in the department's history. She was the principal advisor to the Secretary of Defense in the formulation of national security and defense policy. Um, oversight of military plans and operations, and relevant to our topic today, implementing women, peace, and security initiatives following President Obama's executive order in 2011. She led the development of the Department of Defense's 2012 strategic guidance and represented the department in dozens of foreign engagements in the media before Congress. In January 2007, Michelle co-founded CNAS, um, and uh, she returned as CEO in 2014. Uh, previously, she was senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies for several years, and prior to that, a distinguished research professor at the U Institute for National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. I should also say that it was widely rumored that she was Hillary Clinton's pick for Secretary of Defense. I won't ask Michelle to comment on that. Uh, and as we will discuss, she turned down a very prestigious position in the Trump administration serving as a deputy uh, director of Secretary of Defense. So you'll now give me a minute while I transition to have a chat with Michelle. We're not going to have formal remarks, but just make this an informal conversation and leave plenty of time for audience engagement. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really thrilled to have you well, here. I'm thrilled to be here, and thanks to everyone for coming, and thanks and particularly uh, to you all for making this possible. It's an honor. As I warned you when we chatted about uh, what we were going to talk about, I'd like to start with some biographical questions, a little bit about your experiences serving in the Department of Defense. So in both of the capacities, you served in both the Clinton administration and the Obama administration, you were a civilian woman mm -hmm. serving in the Department of Defense. Okay. Uh, and I want to start with the civilian part, and then we'll come to the, to the woman part. Um, as most of this room probably knows, but maybe is not well understood, uh, our, def our national defense, unlike in other countries, many other countries, is under civilian leadership. And that means there's a very complex relationship between the officials on the White House side and the officials on DOD side who were part of the military, excuse me, part of the military establishment. What was it like being a civilian interacting in that environment? Well, um, I think one of uh, the pillars of our democracy is that we do have civilian control of our military. And actually, that's a very, uh, that, that fact is embraced and respected and welcomed by the military officers that I've encountered. Um, they think it's a strength of our system. We often, in our security cooperation with other countries, urge them to adopt a similar model with mixed success. But, um, but so the, the, the chain of command, if you will, goes from the president as commander in chief to the secretary of defense then uh, not to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who is simply in an advisory role, but to the actual combatant commanders. Um, and so the Secretary of Defense is the key translator of, of sort of direction from the president to the military. And so in my role, I was part of his staff advising him 
on how to make those decisions about where, you know, what our strategy should be, where to deploy forces, when and how to use force, and so forth. Um, and I think as um, civilians who were empowered, I mean, a lot of it depends on how empowered you're, you are uh, uh, working. Someone like Secretary Gates was very empowering of his deputies. Um, so it, it came to be known that if you wanted to propose an operational uh, concept to the secretary, there were two people who you had to see first. One was me to get the policy blessing, and the second was uh, Jay Johnson, who was the lawyer. And if you didn't have those two folks on board, on the civilian side, you weren't walking through the door to the office. Literally, you would not go into the office. So, um, so I think that was very empowering. I had to remember that I was not in the chain of command. Right. I was advising the senior civilian who was in the chain of command. And I think sometimes civilian, where we, civilians get into trouble or there's friction is when folks in the office of the Secretary of Defense or in the national security staff forget that they are not the civilian in the civilian control. <laughs> it's their, the president or it's the Secretary of Defense. And their role is primarily to advise those people to make the best decisions possible. And what is the reception from those in uniform to the civilian side of? of you know, I think it, it, it uh, my experience in the Clinton administration was very different than Obama, mainly because of my level of experience and seniority. When I walked through the door in the Clinton administration, I was barely 30 uh, something. I was civilian, I was a democratic political appointee, and I was a woman. I mean, like, talk <laughs> about how many strikes against you can you have walking in. Um, and I had to earn my way towards being respected. And that's generally true for anybody, but, you know, I had to be hyper competent. I had to be hyper affected to sort of earn my stripes and to have my military counterparts take me seriously. Um, Coming in as undersecretary, as Gates' right-hand person on policy issues, and 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 I just it was a different situation. Um, they, they, I was empowered by the position. I was empowered by the faith that he, you know, put in me in a very public manner, and then reinforced in how decisions were made that it really wasn't uh, an issue. I had to avoid the minding that I was often the only woman in the room. Um, or you know, I, I just, I, I had to not let it bother me. I mean, it did bother me, but I had to let it not be seen to bother me that there weren't more women. And I think I credit both um, President Obama and um, Secretary Gates in understanding that diversity in these situations is an asset. When you bring more people with different backgrounds, different experiences, different perspectives, to the decision-making or advising table, you're going to get better decisions. You're going to get higher performance. All of the business literature has documented how more diverse boards, leadership teams result in higher performing organizations. Same is true in national security. Um, and so they were very supportive of taking the number of senior women leaders from a very small number to, you know, I would say I have 30% of my leaders on my staff, or 30, 35% were women from where I inherited it, which was well under 20. So, I mean, my, in the Clinton administration, we had a senior women's lunch where eight of us showed up, right? And the whole, for weeks, they were always like, what were they talking about? What were they planning? All, all eight of them, you know? <laughs> like some major conspiracy. If you, you know, in the, by the end of the Obama administration, had you called a women's leadership gathering in the Pentagon, you would have overflowed the executive dining room. <laughs> I don't think that's true anymore today. But, um, you know, it's, it's a, there's progress being made. Has it, is it enough? Is it where it needs to be? No. But there is progress over time. And of course, there was a sea change from the Clinton administration to the Obama administration just with the passage of time and Obama's commitment. Uh, of course, I mean, you had a, a woman Secretary of State mm -hmm. um, and eventually a, several. a, a, a yeah. woman uh, National Security yeah. Advisor, right, yeah. several uh, female uh, Secretaries of State. So it was already a more receptive mm -hmm. environment. Yeah. Um, but can you recall any times that you really felt like, 
I, I just, I've hit a glass ceiling or I'm, I'm uh, running up against attitudes that, you know, I can't I, Again, with. I felt that when I was in the junior position, I had, you know, people say extraordinary things to me <laughs> um, that were inappropriate. But um, by the time I, I came back as undersecretary, they didn't dare um, because the position was so empowered um, and Gates clearly had my back. Now, we've spent the afternoon talking about women, peace, and security and the UN resolution 1325 that, that uh, committed, uh, that was passed by the UN Security Council in two, uh, 2000 and committed all member states to increase the number of women in leadership roles. And, uh, you said that organizations function better when there's diversity. The WPS initiative, of course, was founded partly on data uh, that indicated that women in particular have something to bring to conflict resolution and peacemaking and diplomacy. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with that and, and whether or not you think those, you see those foundations there? I certainly think that when you look at, um, you know, situations where we've been either trying to prevent conflict negotiate an end to conflict, recover from conflict, there's overwhelming data now and great research that documents that the participation of women and the degree to which women participate um, has a huge impact on the quality and sustainability of the outcomes um, in the resolution. Um, there's now also research that documents the correlation between um, states where there's gro the gross gender inequality and states that are more prone to conflict. Um, my own personal little microcosm was I, I certainly experienced, not only in DOD, but even particularly, I would think the, the group was more diverse when you looked interagency, when you had the National Security Council meeting at various levels. Um, and bringing in the State Department and USAID and Treasury and sometimes Commerce and DOD and the military and the civilians, that the, the, the diversity of that group just, um, definitely impacted how well we explored the decision space and the, the, the amount of orthogonal thinking, different perspectives that were brought in. And I think the quality of advice that we were able to give up the chain, including dissenting voices or, or voices that maybe saw things in a different way, I think the diversity added to the robustness of the debate. And for a president like Obama, who wanted to hear that dissent and to, to, to sort of fully form his views, it really was one of the things that contributed to giving him the, the support that he was looking for. It was sort of a stereotype of women that they're going to be better at making peace and they're better at bringing people together. And actually that image of women, the sort of Carol Gilligan in a different voice and so on, is, is controversial among yeah. feminists. Um, uh, and, and then of course we, all, we have the you know, Margaret Thatcher's of, of this world who, who seem you know, more hawkish. Um, but what is your impression about the, whether or not women have a particular orientation? Are they more in apt my, to make peace? Are they in my experience, you can't um, assume that all women have the same views. I mean, I'm sure she wouldn't mind my saying. There are times when, you know, Susan Rice and Sam Power and, you know, Hillary Clinton, I mean, the women at the table were having fierce arguments about things. So <laughs> right, it's right, not right. like, you know, you're a woman, therefore you have a certain point of view. Um, but I do think it, we have, we all come from, I, I think having diversity of experience, not only in terms of gender, um, but in other senses as well, is very, very important and valuable to have at the table. The other thing that I found, um, that really uh, resonated with the military folks is when you are in country and dealing in a situation like Iraq or Afghanistan, um, if you can't access or engage literally half the population, you're gonna have an intelligence problem, you're gonna have a buy-in problem, you're gonna have a partner problem, you're gonna have a problem actually getting things done and making meeting your objectives. And I think the thing that when I, and during my period, the thing that really got the military on board with things like WPS was those very pragmatic practical concerns, realizing that if they didn't 
figure out how to engage half of the population in these countries, they weren't ever going to get to the sort of objectives they were meant to be aiming for. But just uh, another question about WPS. It's, a, it's a, actually a, quite a complex resolution in that it both covers and has as an ambition increasing the number of women um, and in addressing women as victims and, and um, a sexual assault as a tool of war. Um, do you think it was a good idea to put those two halves together? Um, and are they intrinsically related or, um, or not? Uh, you know, I don't, I think grouping them together is, is, was, I mean, fine. They do require very different types of actions and, right. and even different people. You know, if you say, like, okay, who's worrying about one versus the other in the Pentagon? Very different people, very different right. staffs. And so um, it's, WPA is one of those things that seems very obvious and straightforward on the surface, but when you go to actually implement it, it's quite complex right. uh, and multidimensional. And that's one of the reasons why we struggle to do the implementation well. Right. Right. Now, we saw that for a while Congress would not um, support the WPS uh, uh, international initiative. And then quite amazingly, a few years ago, President Trump uh, issued an executive order for the implementation of, of uh, WPS. Um, how did you understand that decision on his part? I mean, where did, where did that come from? Was he was he napping when he signed the order? I, did he know what he was? You no, know, I don't know the inside. I would love to know the inside story, and I don't know the inside story. I don't know if this was something that his daughter Ivanka championed. If this was one of those things, I, I really I can't even try to speculate. It was not um, what I think anybody expected, but great that it's been it's been signed. And we do uh, know Ivanka has been very supportive yes, of this yes. and, and is uh, yeah. following up with yeah. an advisory yeah. committee to work yeah. on the implementation. I, I just I think the um, you know the, the there has been you know I, I think I, I hope that this is one of those things that just moves forward of its own um, because it's of value across the bipartisan spectrum, across the interagency, because it's, it's, it, it, it has positive impact. And not, I hope that this doesn't get politicized. I would like this not to be yeah. championed by one party or another, or one president or another, but to see this is a, as a as if we're going to succeed, this has to be an effort that gets moved forward across multiple administrations over time. Now, you mentioned that we seem to be going backwards in, in recent years, and in fact, um, in some senses, in an article uh, that appeared in Foreign Policy by Heather Hurlburt and Tamara kaufman Wittes, uh, they said that only 15% of those listed as senior defense officials on the department's website are female. Um, and um, argued that the low numbers of women in senior national security positions do not reflect the emerging talent pool, uh, that more than half of graduate students of international affairs are female, but women have never exceeded 40% of senior positions. So what's happening as you move up the leadership chain uh, in terms of women? Yeah, I mean, I think that you have to start with the, the pipeline. Um, and there, when I was coming into the field, there weren't that many women choosing particularly the hard side of security, yeah. Um, yeah. defense. Um, I was started out cut, cut my, cutting my teeth on nuclear weapons, which is like the hardest of hard security. Um, so there weren't a lot of women in the pipeline. Now we don't have that excuse. There are a ton of women in the pipeline. There are a lot of, you could definitely hit 50-50 kind of, um, talent pools at the junior and mid-level. I still think in the senior levels it's probably a little less than that, but several other things um, step in. So I, I had the chance after I left the administration to serve on the advisory board to the director of the CIA, uh, first Petraeus, then Brennan. And they came to the board and said, we have a serious diversity problem. Every CIA class is, um, uh, recruited 50-50, and they've been hitting that goal for years. But you know, fast forward 15 years, 
and when you're looking at promotion to the senior intelligence service, which is like the senior executive service, um, only 23% of the pool is women, despite the fact that women are documented to perform equally well. So what, what is happening here? Right. And what we found in that study was, um, first of all, that there are um, cultural and uh, operational barriers. For example, it's a very, what I call the mini-me culture, mm -hmm. um, particularly on the operational side, where you're a, an experienced man in the field and you're looking to mentor someone, oh, that young 25-year-old, he reminds me of my younger self. I'm going to choose to mentor him. Or I'm going to choose to sponsor him for a promotion, for a new opportunity, for a job. That was thing one. Thing two was um, a lot of the promotion was tied to being deployed, repeatedly deployed since 9-11. You know, if women are trying to balance family, um, uh, that becomes a lot harder. There's some, you know, there isn't to say there are women that don't do it, but there, that was affecting the promotion rates and, frankly, the calculus of a number of women. Then you have mindset issues that are self-imposed. Like, you know, you, they did these tests where they showed men and women who are roughly equally qualified a job description with 10 criteria. The guy would say, hey, I got 6 out of 10. I'm going to apply for this. Yeah, right. The woman right. would say, I've got 9 out of 10. I can't apply. Apply, right. Right? So the <laughs> self-censorship, you know. Um, and on and on. So there, and then, and then the problem of there, you know, when women hit uh, childbearing, the policies to allow them to take time and then come back um, and stay with their cohort in terms of promotion and progress, those systems weren't there, and so forth. So there are all these factors that you know this was in the agency, but I think it's true across the national security community that just made it a lot harder for women to stay in there and get all the way to the senior levels. You now we've just, uh, another thing um, that has just happened uh, under the new um, uh, military budget, that there have been changes to family leave plans uh, for huge. the military. And how significant are those? How much of they a difference huge. will I they think, make? I think if you can uh, be serious about family leave, not just for women, but also for parental leave, if you can give women um, on ramps, whether they come right back or they take some time off, what you see the agency doing now is, you know, when a woman wants to take a few years off to have kids and get them in school, she hasn't forgotten her craft. She hasn't lost her mind. She hasn't, you know, lost her expertise. Right. Right. So the, the CIA has had tremendous success recruiting women back once their kids are in school to be to continue on being groomed as senior intelligence professionals. And so I think we need to have much more flexibility there. And it doesn't not just women, maybe the dad wants to take time mm -hmm. off and, and right. have that leaves flexibility. Equally so I think yeah. the military, you know, actually I'll the Navy was way out uh, ahead and proposed a whole series of Thing, flexible personnel policies they wanted to try, and they were actually dialed back because the services decided it would be very disruptive and difficult if the services were all working on different systems. Right. So they sort of they're, they've been taking a more incremental approach. But I do think that some of this is moving in the right direction. It's just not fast enough. Not fast enough. Let, let's talk a little bit about uh, developments in foreign policy. Um, and elsewhere under the current administration. So I just want to go back to, to what I mentioned previously. You were um, selected for uh, Deputy Defense Secretary and, and declined. Can you say a little bit about your so, thinking? Um, I have worked with a known uh, Jim Mattis for years. Um, we were close colleagues when he was in uniform and I was the under. So when he was tapped to be Secretary of Defense, he called me said, I need your help. Um, I you know, need someone who knows how to run the building, you know, manage internally. Um, what do you think? You know, you really, I'm calling on your sense of duty. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, That's so, tough. <laughs> and, and I do have a sense of duty. Um, but I, as the, as, you know, and so I, I did consider it seriously. 
Um, but as we got closer to, you know, inauguration and so forth, um, I, I just had trouble reconciling my own sense of right and wrong, my own values with this president and his policies. And, and I was, you know, I was sort of like Ham, Hamlet on the Potomac. I was like, when I was going to do it, I know I can't do it, I was new. it. And finally, uh, Jim, uh, Secretary Mattis is swearing in. You remember, uh, Trump surprised him. Mattis did not know this was going to happen, and he was very upset. Surprised him by announcing the travel ban, the Muslim travel ban, yeah. at yeah. Secretary Mattis's swearing in. Mm -hmm. And when I watched that, I was like, I can't, I can't be part of this. I can't do it. And so at that point, I told him, I'm so sorry, but I can't, I can't be part of it. It just so I assume he understood your decision. Yeah, 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 yeah. He understood. Um, now, now he had a complicated, uh, but I think uh, quite honorable tenure as Secretary of Defense. One of the things that, in fact, is related to our current conversation about WPS is the reaction he had when Trump uh, tweeted that he was imposing a ban on transgenders in the military. Yeah. Whereupon I gather that also was a surprise to Secretary yeah. Mattis. He did. wasn't expecting that particular tweet to come along that day. And um, Mattis said, um, first of all, a tweet is not an order. I'm waiting for a, a real order to come along. Yeah. Um, and he also said, you know, we're not implementing this one. Yeah. Um, now, eventually it did get implemented, but but... Did he do the right thing under those circumstances, and how does I mean, one I think deal? What, what Mattis did consistently during his tenure was sometimes it was by tweet, sometimes it was a call from the Oval saying, hey, you know, such and such a foreign leader is arriving tomorrow. We have a trade deficit with them. I'm going to tell them they even have to write me a check for $50 billion. I'm going to pull all, all my troops out or whatever. I mean, you know, stuff like that. And, and so Mattis would have to go say, you know, Mr. President, I have a few minutes for your time today. Right. And he'd drop everything, <laughs> go over and try to talk Trump or President Trump through the issue and why that wasn't such a good idea. And more often than not, particularly early on, um, Mattis did influence him, walk him back from some of the more um, ill-considered moves. And so he used that tactic again and again. I think over time, he became less, uh, just didn't have the same effect on the president. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time it got to the Syria decision, where Mattis had numerous conversations about abandoning the Kurds and the damage that would do, not only to that relationship and our efforts in, against ISIS in Syria, but to every other, you know, make every other ally question whether we would turn around and abandon them in the heat of battle. Um, I think that up until that point, he had had a number of successes, but at that point, he did not succeed, and then it was up to him. He had a, you know, can, are you willing to be a part of this decision that you think is, it may be legal, but it's more, in Jim Mattis's mind, it was not the moral thing to do, and at that point, he did what you do, which is he resigned. So to take another example, the deployment of troops to the border uh, was highly controversial, um, and uh, as we were uh, talking about earlier, there's a general principle of posse comitatus, which says that the military should not be involved in uh, civilian um, policy, advancing civilian policies and policing um, uh, civilians. And so they cannot be involved in uh, supporting the immigration uh, policies and the... And the um, uh, dealing with the detention centers and so on, yet they are they are in a kind of supportive capacity. So, you know, um, this, this is something that the, I think every senior uniformed officer I've dealt with understands posse comitatus is very, believes in the importance of it and wants to see it upheld. Um, and yet, across multiple administrations, I think this one has been the most uh, Significant in what they've asked for, but even under Obama, there were you know under Bush, under several presidents, you've had periods where there were troops at the border. What the military has taken pains to do is to construct that so that they are not in the direct policing or law enforcement role. They are 
basically being used in logistics or in um, intelligence can, uh, or you know, sort of providing staffing relief in the rear so that border control and ICE can go forward. That gets pretty close it to the line, close. doesn't no, it? No, you have to, it gets very close to the line. Um, and, but I do think that if you actually asked this leadership to cross the line, mm -hmm. they would refuse. Uh -huh. I actually think you'd see people resigning not, and not to cross that line. So would that On produce a, a crisis? I yes. mean, if, if, um, if the president really pushed that line yeah, and tried people. to get the army to run detention centers, do you think you would, would see Secretary Esper refusing to implement this? Um, request and and so I what think, would happen next? I think, you know, I think it has. You have to come down to the individual. I there are people in uniform who I'm quite sure would resign rather than implement that order, and then there are civilians who would argue strongly against it, and then whether they would oppose it or go along with it reluctantly, open question. There are these judgment call areas where. You know, I had the experience several times of not having my policy advice taken. Mm -hmm. um, the rapid withdrawal from Iraq, I, yes, I wanted to see us ultimately get out of Iraq, but I thought the final piece of it was done too, too hastily, too fast, and I worried about the resurgence of ISIS, and that is what happened. Um, but I lost that. I had plenty of time to, you know, opportunities to make that argument. The president heard it. We decided to go a different way. At that point, I have to decide, you know, it's not illegal. I mean, people can argue. I don't think it's immoral. I just think it's a policy difference. So I chose not to resign. I chose to stay part of the administration and keep giving the president and the secretary my best advice. But if for, it's a personal judge, someone, the legality question should be pretty clear, but even sometimes that's argued. The morality question is one of personal judgment. If someone feels this is immoral, I cannot do this, then it's a, then your option is to resign. Um, and but then the president has the option to just replace you. Right. So we could see <laughs> so one can imagine, and then this may happen um, if uh, Donald Trump is reelected, uh, putting the kind of pressure on DOD and its leadership that he has put on the Attorney General's office yeah. and see a sort of uh, decreasing independence. Uh, DOD, I think partly because of Madison's leadership, mm -hmm. has sort of retained its uh, robustness and, and, uh, and its at least partial independence and, and ability to judge um, legality. Um, but you, you saw this play out in, a, in the case of um, the president's decision to intervene in the military justice system's treatment of this Navy SEAL, Gallagher, Gallagher who yeah. was accused of right. war crimes, where um, you know the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of the Navy were arguing strongly, let the military justice system work. It's very, very important that we, they be, for good order and discipline, that the system hold its own members to account. So let this happen, um, because there are all kinds of negative second and third order effects if you intervene. Uh, the president decided to intervene anyway. You had one official decide to stay, and one official decide to leave. Um, now, how damaging was that for the military's own sense of, of duty and order? And uh, I mean, it was really. I think it a, was. Uh, I think well, second. It's. I think it's second only to the withdrawal from Syria mid mid sort of, you know, battle, if you will, uh, in terms of the the resistance, the the negative reaction that it engendered in the uniformed military. They do. They didn't want. Do not think that politics should be entering into the disciplinary justice system of the military. I have not yet to find a single military officer who agreed with the president's intervention. Um, and now, I think the SEAL community will write itself. They're going. I mean, I. Should full disclosure, I'm the mom of a SEAL in training, so <laughs> okay. I hear a lot about the SEAL community and what it's going through, but. 
you know, every junior officer is debating whether what would he have, or she have done as a, that lieutenant that allowed the pictures to be taken, you know, all of that. Um, everyone's debating how they would have handled someone like that in their unit. This is a community that will get through this and will get back to, you know, being on the straight and narrow. But the, but the president's intervention made it harder, not easier. Now, the, the military, um, I think, has a very strong sense of rule of law. Uh, and, and so you're really relying on that sense to uh, sort of, you know, right itself in the wake of this kind of intervention. Um, is, in your experience, is, is it generally the case that the sort of culture of legality is stronger on the, among military leaders than civilian who are more thinking of policy ramifications? And it's so, it really depends on the administration. Um, you know, in the Obama administration, there, when we had NSC meetings talking about use of force, the lawyers had a prominent place at the table. The first question that we would discuss in considering any option was, does this have a basis in domestic law? Does it have a basis in international law? And then you'd have, is it the right thing to do? Does it make sense? Is it in our interests? All that. Well, President Obama took the, the rule of law very seriously. Um, I don't, I haven't heard, I mean, this NSC process in this administration is much more ad hoc and haphazard. I have not heard of that same level of attention being given to the legal bases for action, so I think it's, it's different. But um, I do think that this is inculcated in military education, in military training, in military culture. Um, you can always find rogue elements or elements who don't appreciate it, but particularly in the officer corps, they absolutely, um, this is, you know, drummed into them. Now, I want to press you a little on, on Obama and legality. Yeah. So, uh, and we talked about this earlier. Um, in 2013, Obama gave a speech at the National Defense University where he said, we need a legal framework for dealing with targeted killing. Right. Four years into the administration, when the number of targeted killings had just right. you know, in incredibly um, escalated, uh, to many of us it seemed, you know, now? Yeah. Now you want a legal yeah. framework? Um, with the thought that he wanted to pass that framework on to his successor. But there was a lot of criticism of the Obama administration mm -hmm. on, on sort of playing fast yeah. and loose with uh, uh, targeted killing. So um, yeah. this is where the perfect meets the enemy is the enemy of the good. Because uh -huh. Obama from day one examined the uh, inherited authorization of use of military force from 2011 in Iraq and saw that it desperately needed to be updated as the threat was evolving. He went, he had tons of conversation with people on both sides of the aisle on the Hill, begging them to update the AUMF, to give him clear guidance, direction, authorization from Congress. Congress could not, a divided Congress could not get their heads, they didn't want to touch it because they didn't really want to own it. When they did, like people like Tim Kaine got in there and tried. Um, you had others on the other side that tried to pull in a different direction. We got nowhere. So here you are, a president who is a lawyer by training, who cares about this stuff. You know you need an, an, a better AUMF. The Congress is refusing to act or unable to act. Yet, you are sitting down every month doing your counterterrorism review and looking at no, I mean, I just to give you a rough order of magnitude, between 20 and 25 active, no kidding, threat streams against the United States of America every single month. I mean, ongoing. And he is trying to prevent another mass casualty event on the, in the United States against an embassy, against US forces stationed overseas. He has what he has, and he's trying, he's trying to do his job as commander in chief not what he would prefer. He's not this in the situation he preferred, but he doesn't have, but he has to, he feels he's responsible to prevent these situations. So what does he do? He ramps up the criteria that is used to judge the legitimacy and the legality of the targeting. 
So the number of intelligence sources, the quality of the intelligence, the they, you know, just drives the military lawyers crazy with the amount of like due diligence on each and every target and each and every operation. So you hear accusations of micromanagement sometimes of the Obama NSC. Or, or this was paralysis of, by analysis. Right, but this was part of the compensation for the fact that we did not have the, the right um, framing from the Congress, and so he was trying to get that level of due diligence and care through the part of the process he could control to make sure that we, we, we stayed on the right side of the law and we stayed on the right side of, you know, targeting the right people and not, you know, being sloppy. Now that just, of course, has to do with authorization from Congress. Yes. That doesn't has, have to do with legality under, under international humanitarian no, 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 no. And so then there's the so, question of what yeah. is imminent threat, right? And we were talking about this before, so, you know, um, some of these groups, like take Al Qaeda. After Al Qaeda, in the, the in Pakistan, was really decimated and 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 not act doing much effective attack planning against us. The primary homeland threat was coming out of Al Qaeda in Yemen, and there was a bomb maker who was figuring out how to put explosives into human beings that could then become passengers on flights. People have now written about this. It's you know, it's out there in the public domain. So judgments about exactly when is that imminent? Is it when we see them talking about actually having the device, you know, designing the device, testing the device, having the device, recruiting the human, the human leaves to the airport. Like, the longer this goes on, the, the harder it is going to be to stop because our system isn't designed to do that. And, and of so, course, you had the backup and of so the Office of Obama Legal Counsel. Obama authorized, yeah. authorized the targeting of the bomb maker. Right, right. Um, and you did have backup from the Office of Legal Counsel on this point of imminence, um, and, and a memo that was written uh, around the time of the targeting of, yeah. of Anwar al awlaki yeah. But that memo, in my view, has been rightly criticized as a bit of a legal mess. These were really, really hard. Yeah, calls. yeah, yeah. Um, calls. And, and on the side of, of um, sort of one more I just point say I am not a lawyer, so I cannot I argue know. credibly argue the finer legal points. But I watched the president agonize over his responsibility yeah. as commander in chief in protecting the United States and the the gray areas that he had to you right. know, work right. through. And uh, you know, on the authorization side, I'll just make one one more comment on that, which is that um, I don't think. DOD was out there saying, hey, Mr. President, you need a new AUMF or you can't act here. And, and indeed, Searle did a, did a briefing for Army JAG in which we argued for the need for a new AUMF. And they presented their position to us, which was, you know, what the Associated Forces Doctrine is good enough for us. You know, we'll, we'll take that authorization. We're OK with it. Um, so, so, you know, whether it's DOD's responsibility to provide leadership on that, but I understand your point about the paucity of tools that Congress had, had left uh, DOD with. Um, so flash forward to uh, another use of targeted killing, uh, Soleimani. Um, now, uh, you know, that's a very different situation because there you have a state actor, not a non-state actor, mm -hmm. though he's the designated head of a, of, of a terrorist group. Um, how do you see the wisdom around the t strike on Soleimani and also not asking you to be a lawyer here, but your sense of the permissibility of the action? So um, two previous presidents have had the same opportunity. Bush had it and Obama had it multiple times. They both chose not to exercise the option. Why? It wasn't because this wasn't a horrible human being with you know, who was a terrorist mastermind, had the blood of hundreds, maybe more, maybe thousands of Americans on his hands, um, 
was wreaking havoc in the region through these proxy forces that um, seek to destabilizing, destabilize multiple regimes that we partner with. Um, you know, this was a very bad guy. <laughs> so in that sense, you know, common sense would say he deserves to be in the crosshairs. Um, the problem is, first problem, is he was also probably the second most powerful official in the state of Iran. And if you start targeting state officials in other countries, you know, we basically take, open the Pandora's box for anybody to use assassination as a tool of foreign policy. So I seriously worry now, like when our central command commander, who's a friend of mine, Frank McKenzie, goes to Iraq, is he at risk of assassination? When the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, when the Secretary of Defense goes to Iraq, is it fair game to assassinate them? You assassinated our guys, why can't we assassinate yours? I mean, it just right. opens up a horrible um, Pandora's box. Um, the second thing is from a strategic and policy perspective, to do it on Iraqi soil right. without the knowledge or authorization of the host government. Especially when we have troops stationed there. At a point right. where the population has risen up to protest the over, overreach of Iran and the influence of Iran in their society. Like to take that and, and basically conduct a strike that is so offensive to Iraqi sovereignty and suddenly flips, takes all that rage and turns it against the United States of America um, and, and saying, get, get the Americans out. It's just strategically, it doesn't, it's not thoughtful. I mean, one of the things you learn about this use of forces, this is not checkers. You don't play one move at a time. You have to think, what's, the set, what's the what's the next second order effect, third order effect, unanticipated consequence, risk that we're not thinking of. And once you look at all of that, you weigh the costs of not only uh, action and inaction. And the truth is the military, the Pentagon presented him, the president with several other options that could have sent a deterrent message to Iran right. without putting on the table all of these negatives. So. You know, to me, it was as, as horrible as this person was, as guilty of terrible crimes as they were, taking the action in this way at this time in this place was not strategically wise. And probably not legal under international law either. But the distinction between, between targeting non-state actors and targeting state actors mm -hmm. may be too fine a line you know, sort of for the public to draw and, and possibly for our international uh, humanitarian law to, to draw, um, you know, in the, in the long run. And so it may be really hard to, to keep that when you... Especially when someone wears two hats. He's the well, head exactly. of a designated, legally exactly. designated terrorist organization. Right. But he's also an official in the Iranian government. Which you always have when you're dealing with you know, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's that's a complication there. Um, let's talk a, a, a little bit more about Middle East policy and, and recent developments. Um, you opposed the quick drawdown many years ago of, of troops out of Iraq. Um, can you make a few, uh, give us a few thoughts about the drawdown of, of troops from Syria? And, and the consequences. You mentioned briefly the betrayal of the Kurds, which produced an incredibly strong reaction here in this country. Um, I thought at, at that moment, uh, the sort of neoconservative uh, wing of the Republican Party might be, might be ready to impeach him. <laughs> um, but uh, tell us your thoughts about that decision and its consequences. So, you know, I think, um even before the president's decision, we had reduced our presence in Syria to primarily an advise and assist role, um, supporting the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are two-thirds Kurdish and about a third Arab, um, in basically fighting ISIS and driving them out of territory. Um, and, and I think the the taking away of the territorial caliphate in Syria was in large part thanks to 
um, our special operations forces empowering and enabling the Syrians to do the heavy lifting on that, the Syrian Democratic Forces. So this was an advise and assist miss mission that, which already had, you know, very limited numbers of our troops involved, and you know, had the the partnering with the SDF had huge kind of force multiplying effects right. in terms of the fight against ISIS. So you've had success in limiting their territory, but the civil war is, is not over. You've got tens of thousands of ISIS fighters and families in detention centers. Mm -hmm. And now, because the Turkish president calls you and says, we don't like some of these Kurds, right. we want you to withdraw, you just say, OK, no consultation, no planning, no nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, you tell your military to pull back. Um, Do you take that as the primary reason? I mean, this president had said from the beginning, and it was part of his uh, campaign uh, promise to um, you know, stop fighting forever wars and bring troops home. Yeah, but to do so it on. in a way, if, if you wanted to do this, OK, do it in the right way. Don't right. do it in a way where the people that you were fighting with yesterday, alongside, they were fighting so you didn't have to be right in front, on the front line of the action. And tomorrow, you're going to abandon them, and they're going to get slaughtered by Turkish forces. Right, right. Just, Moreover, ceding the area to the Russians and, and the Turks. And, and then, yeah, I mean, it just, our it, I think the, the, the military ethic is that's very hard for people to swallow. And I think it was that was the last straw for, for uh, General Mattis. Um, you know, since then, Trump has been convinced to moderate. And so now we're, we don't have as many, but we still have forces there. But they're there to protect the oil. Right, right. And, and as I think we're the, the, I think ours the, to take. Right, yeah. right. Um, so I think. You know, this is, it's just um, not a way, and, and allies watch, or allies from around the world watch this, right? So um, I remember, actually, when, um, when President Obama drew a red line in Syria about chemical weapons use and then chose not to enforce it. Who was in my office, I was at the think tank at the time, who was in my office the next day? The Japanese, mm. because President Obama has also drawn red lines vis-a-vis -vis China about the Senkaku Islands, mm -hmm. and they were like, we thought a red line meant like commitment, mm -hmm. and that we could count on that. So, what does this mean for us? So, what'd you tell them? I told them that it's different. We have a defense treaty. Article Five of the defense treaty includes the Senkakus. It's a treaty. It's different. But, you know, it, it made them very nervous. Uh -huh. And so, you know, the worry from our military is not just, it's about, obviously, the, the, the sort of out, the immediate partners in Syria, but it's also about, okay, tomorrow, next year, when we need to ask another partner to do something really har hard and go into harm's way for us on our priority, what are they going to say? They're going to point back this and say, well, look what you, look what you did to the Kurds. Why should I do that? Right, right. So it's an enormous betrayal. But let me play devil's advocate just yes. for a moment. Yeah. Um, let's paint the other scenarios. So our troops remain in Syria. Um, uh, they're protecting the Kurds who are guarding members of ISIS. How does that situation end? Yeah. What do we do, first of all, with, with all of these ISIS detainees, yeah. their wives, their children? Who no country well, this wants is to where take. that right. where you know um, at some point you pay the piper for um, damaging your alliances. Um, I think you know I am the first person to say that we need to have better burden sharing with our allies, particularly our NATO allies. Look at Secretary Gates's last speech before he read, left office. It was all about this. So but, Trump is not the first one to, no, to and, strike this. And I to... supported that message, absolutely. But it's not the only thing. Those same allies invoked Article 5 of NATO's treaty for us, 
the only time it's ever been invoked after 9-11. When we went to Afghanistan, they sent 40,000 troops of their own. They suffered casualties. They suffered injuries. They made sacrifice. There are a lot of things that you need to take into account in battling allies. There is nothing that we can take on alone, whether it's ISIS, whether it's climate change, whether it's nonproliferation, pick your hard problem, without our allies. Now, if you were investing in those allies and treating them with respect and treating as, them as true partners, I would argue that it comes to a hard problem of what are we going to do with these detainees? How are we going to manage this? We would have a much better chance of figuring out either a common solution to de-radicalization or divvying up of the risk in terms of who's accepting who back. But part of the sort of forget it, I don't even want to talk about it, I think is the fact that the alliances are not in great shape right now mm -hmm. to do hard things. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this is a really tough domestic political issue for any politician in Europe right now. What, you're gonna let ISIS hardened ISIS fighters back into the country. But, you know, I think that you have to, um, you know, I think those are the hard questions you have to work with allies, but if you're not investing in those relationships and treating them well, you're going to make it harder for yourself. So let me, let me switch gears now briefly and uh, talk a little bit about Russia. Um, so if I have this right, um, when Mitt Romney was running for president, um, you criticized him on the grounds that he said that he saw Russia as our chief uh, threat. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe you said something like, you know, what is this, the Cold War? Are you still uh, fighting the Cold War? President Obama made that point in a debate. Okay. <laughs> I then went out and echoed it. Okay, yes. fair enough. So but at the time, yes, um, I did at the say time, that. Right? I, did, I was not the originator of the thought, but I didn't. Okay, it. so was um, was Mitt Romney prescient on Russia, or was he then in misguided? Way, and I've actually up on the hill. I was asked this question, and I think uh -huh. I I think we were wrong. Um, at the time, I, I'll explain why that was a perception at the time. At the time, we were in the middle of the reset. Um, we had. Putin was out of office, um, or at least in a kind of back, uh, behind the scenes role. You had Medvedev uh, in office. You had all kinds of cooperation going on. You had all kinds of efforts to renew the arms control discussion, the non-proliferation discussion, the <coughs> Afghanistan discussion, the Middle East. I mean, everything was engaged, and we, you know, were making some modest progress. Um, and Russia seemed to be behaving itself relative to its past record, okay? So um, I think, you know, to Romney's credit, he understood that Putin was still pulling the strings. Mm -hmm. Putin is who he is. He's a, KB, a trained KGB operative. That's how he thinks. He was never changing his stripes. Um, and so I think it was both that the, the president in the first term had had a very different experience, was working with Russia productively in some key areas, and Putin was not yet back on the scene. Right. Um, and Romney probably, and you know, saw Russia as, so I think it's a, it was a mix. I, I have just taken ownership and said, had I, do it to do it all, had I to do it all over again, I would not have could have made that criticism. I think he, he proved to be right, and, um, Right, so, that. so the Senate Intelligence Committee last week put out a report that said that the Obama administration was not prepared to deal with the threat of Russian oh. interference in our elections and our political system. Um, do you think that's right? And, and what would you do over if you do agree with that? I think that um, <clears throat> we were caught flat-footed. Um, you know, if you actually, uh, CSIS did a wonderful report on this. If you, the precursor to the intervention in our elections was watching what Putin did in Central and Eastern European elections right. the prior several years. If we were really paying attention to that playbook, we should have expected to, it to come to us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's exactly what happened on right. steroids, right? Absolutely. And, and I think, but then, uh, once the administration really realized 
I was out of it at this point. This was a different time, but I watched this from the outside. Once they really realized the gravity of the situation, then the internal debate was if President Obama talks about this and it reveals the extent of it, will he be perceived, this is now the fall, right before the election, will he be perceived as trying to use this to put his thumb on the scale exactly. of the exactly. election? And so, you know, um, lots of argument about whether that was the right or wrong thing to do. The thing that pains me more is we've had four years to be better prepared. And are we substantially better prepared? Well, you anticipated my next question. <laughs> We're not. We have not, partly because this president has sort of denied that it occurred. He's denied that it had impact. He hasn't wanted to go there. You know, Congress has authorized some funds for states and localities to improve their systems. Some of some of but, those states have refused so, to take those funds, yeah. of course. So, so it's, I think we are very, very vulnerable um, uh, to having some version of this happen or worse. I mean, last time, Russia focused primarily on social media. Mm -hmm. But we also know from what's come out that they put probes into um, state and local registration systems. So right. what happens if we all show up at our polling place and the, re the voter rolls are all screwed up? Right. Or the computer's down? Or, oh, it, looks, it says you've moved. What if swing districts are targeted? That would be chaos. Not to mention the voter suppression chaos. and and right. then the uh, voting sorts of voting screw ups like happened in Iowa. Right. <laughs> but even if you don't error. actually hack the vote itself, right. there's all kinds of ways that it can be even worse this time. So that's what disturbs me the most. That so we've been fairly warned. You know, the, you know, we know right. what's possible, and we have not done enough. So while while you, we don't have enough time for you to set out a full plan to protect the integrity of U.S. elections. Can you give us some thoughts in the direction of what you would do? I mean, sanctions sanctions are unlikely to work. Um, you know, the, the ability of a, an open system of government like a democracy to protect itself, number one, against the kind of propaganda effort that the Russians mounted, but number two, a, a kind of more seriously military effort using cyber uh, is, is very difficult. What, what so, should we be doing? Um, I think, I do think we should try to deter Putin from pulling the trigger on everything he could do um, by trying to figure out what are the things that he truly values, which is really his own hold on power. Mm -hmm. um, you know, limits, I think, maybe, given how extensive the sanctions already are, to how much more we could do there. Um, but I think, frankly, the, our best friend in, is lots of paper. Um, paper ballots. Start printing saying. not only paper ballots and audit trail, but paper registration rules, paper, uh -huh. paper, 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 before it's messed with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I hate to say it. it Wean ourselves off the internet as no, much as No, I'm we not can. saying don't do it, but have, have the files on hand to check against. Mm -hmm. If it happens. Paper backups. It's, it'll take time, but at least you know what it was supposed to be before it was messed with online. The second thing is, I do think that we had a very small tactical success, but I think it's worth repeating. In the 2018 congressional elections, one of the reasons there wasn't more Russian interference is that our, I mean, it's been report, reportedly our own cyber command basically did a bunch of denial of service and, you know, preoccupying attacks on the primary Russian cyber arm that was, would be used in our elections. They were very busy either defending themselves or trying to get their systems back online for the three days prior to our congressional elections and the two days after. That's not bad. That's not, I'll take that, mm -hmm. you know. That's some ta it's not going to solve the problem. But tactically, it's going to help reduce limit damage. The problem is cyber is a different, you know, they, okay, now they've had ex that experience. So they're going to say, we're going to plant all kinds of things in place that we don't have to be doing it the day of. It's just going to happen on, you know, when the timer goes off. And on the broader so. question of um, sort of protecting U.S. democracy against uh, illiberal regimes yeah. that would 
infiltrate our our culture and our. Um, I think the biggest it's is a heart, huge. The biggest thing I think is public education and engagement and debate. I mean, Malin Albright, who's one of my personal heroes, has written a book a year ago that she titled Fascism, A Warning. Right. This is a woman who fled fascism in Europe as a refugee, came to this country. And she's watching our own institutions being put under a kind of political pressure and manipulation that is truly alarming to her, having seen how it was done before in Europe. Um, and she, she titled the book that way to be provocative. But we need to be having a conversation. I think the best defense is training our kids and our citizenry. To, like when you go online and see a conspiracy theory, um, and this just happened to me. Um, my brother lives in China. He's in Beijing right now. And he sent me this article that was from a Russian news source saying that this was all a US military bio plot, that we had released the coronavirus in China to weaken the Chinese as a competitor to the United States. Is this like, commonly believed in And it China? was being circulated on the Chinese social media. And I'm like, time out. Like, look at the source of this article. Look at who's being quoted. I mean, come on. This is, is Russian? Like, yeah, it's all Russian. Yeah. yeah, and I was like, we have to have like at least some little alarm bell that goes off and saying, maybe this isn't true. Maybe the perpetrator, you know, the, the, the folks who put this out there have an ulterior motive. But, you know, we, so that's the, our first line of defense is our own like ability to be, you know, have some objectivity or some skepticism about the information that comes our way and what we ingest and what we do. Do we I'm ask one last question, then open it up to, to the audience? Should rather than a, a new space force, should we be developing a cyber force? Is this is cyber not one of the single greatest threats to? US we we effectively we are use. developing a cyber force. If what you mean is, you know, all of the services now have career fields, mm -hmm. pipe, talent pipelines, recruiting, mm -hmm. professional development, you know, to develop, you know, people who understand how to defend in cyberspace and uh, and and conduct cyber operations when authorized and legal and necessary. Um, and so that's happening. That's emerging. It's not called a cyber force per se, but that's that is Maybe because they can't the figure out the decal. Yeah. They don't have right. you know the Star Wars thing yeah. that they can. And I think what put space. On the uniforms. The, I mean, you can have a debate about whether we need the space force, but I certainly think that space as a domain has changed from kind of a, a place where lots of enabling capabilities like satellites for navigation and communication and surveillance and imagery resided, but it wasn't a place where, you know, kinetic action was going to take place. And now based on the systems that Russia and China and others have developed and deployed and what we see them practicing and testing, we now have to treat, we have to understand that for both cyber and space, these will be early domains of conflict. Meaning if you read Chinese military doctrine, they don't want to go into a head-on-head. -head. They don't want to, nobody wants to go to conflict, you know. But if it happened, if they felt they were heading into a conflict with the United States, they don't want a direct military conflict. They would use cyber and space to try to basically make it extremely difficult for us even to get our forces leaving port, leaving bases to move towards Asia and make it extremely difficult for us to coordinate, communicate, move, navigate, and in the hopes that we would just give up. I think there's some rationale, whether it's it's a space force that we need, but certainly a rationale for focusing. We certainly need more people to understand how to protect. We are so reliant, not only militarily, but economically, on what is in space. Imagine if you didn't have GPS. Think of every, all the applications on our iPhones and our cars, I mean, you know, um, we we certainly need to have people who every day think about how do I defend, 
how do I keep operating in space if there is ever an attack? Of course, my answer to a space force is since law is so important, we should have the law force. Right? <laughs> the little brief yes. on the, okay. <laughs> so let's let the audience in. We have two microphones, one on each side. And um, uh, in fact, um, yeah, if you just hold your hand up, we'll get a microphone to you. And I'd be grateful if you could just introduce yourself before you ask your question. Good evening. Thank you for being here. My name is Lyric Thompson. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Center for Research on Women and was involved in some of the advocacy leading up to the National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. So I'd like to take us back there and ask you to look backwards and then forwards. Looking backwards, what was the hardest part of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, be it the National Action Plan or otherwise, for you to implement as DOD? And then looking forward, if you had the opportunity or interest to serve again, what is the kind of gold standard that you would work toward in that area? Thank you. Um, last one's easy. The full implementation, is, you know, um, and I would love, I mean, miraculously, the, the U.S. did manage to become the first country to pass a law. Amazing. <laughs> it was great. Um, I'd love to see have it become the, you know, the first country to, to actually implement this to the gold standard and to be a model, to have it actually be a main topic of conversation when we work with partners and so forth. So that's, that's the easy part. I think in terms of looking back, um, I think the, the hardest part um, in the DOD was... Uh, Getting people, you know, who already had very limited bandwidth because they were meeting themselves coming and going on deployment after deployment after deployment and two wars simultaneously to take the time to understand why this was important and to accept the additional requirements and the kind of planning burden and, you know, the, the additional burden it put on their staffs. Um, I think, again, um, we worked really hard on trying to get beyond the theoretical, like they could go, okay, I get it, but this is really hard and I'm really busy and I've got all this other stuff. Why does this have to be a priority now? When we had success, it was when we could actually relate it to their mission success right now on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's when I felt we really got traction. Mm -hmm. um, lots of goodwill, but not a lot of bandwidth or extra, you know, energy until we could relate it to their, their core task and their core objective. Um, so that's what I think, you know, that's what we have to do a better job of going forward. Do we have a question over here somewhere? Right. Hi. Uh, my, my name is Jesse Hamilton. I think you, you have to speak into the mic. Okay. Yeah. My name is Jesse Hamilton. I'm not used to speaking in a microphone. I'm a philosophy graduate student here at University of Pennsylvania. Um, first, thank you for your insight. Um, this is a fascinating talk. Uh, what advice do you have for students in the room who are looking to pursue a career in national security? Um, first, come on in. The water's fine. We, your, your country needs you. Um, you know, it's one of the, it's a it's a hard area of service, but it's also among the most rewarding. Um, number two is you have to learn the lang I, I would say pick an area where you're going to go deep and really have a degree of mastery. Um, so I, I sort of think of careers as hourglass. You know, you get this very broad education. As you get into graduate work, you narrow. I felt in the beginning of my time as a practitioner, I had to pick something to become deeply expert in. And that, that ended up, it, I was a product of my times. You know, early 80s, if we didn't prevent nuclear war, we were not going to be around to do anything else. So what did I focus on? Nuclear arms control, nuclear non-proliferation. And I became a true expert down to like missile types and throw weights and I mean, seriously. Um, <laughs> But I had to. You had. I had to gain credibility as mastering, you know, a topic and an area to have license to actually have a, an opinion that was going to be taken seriously. And then once I started writing and publishing in that narrow frame of arms control, 
Um, then I could broaden out, okay, proliferation, or non-proliferation, managing proliferation. And then, you know, and then from there. But I think you have to have, you have to cut your teeth on something to um, really gain that credibility, and then that gives you license to broaden. Um, if you're going to go into an institution, if you, whether it's the DOD or the State Department or whatever, take the time to really learn the craft and culture of the institution. So I spent a lot of time going to military exercises, going to CP operations on the ground, um, talking to people about their education, their career path, their culture, their values, their you, if you're going to be credible as an as civilian overseer, if you will, you've got to really understand and appreciate what it is you're overseeing, mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, and that's important. Um, mentors, finding mentors, finding people uh, who will uh, invest in you, who you can learn from. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, because uh, it's kind of ironic given what I'm doing right now, uh, is like if you have, everybody says play to your strengths. That is great, but if you have a weakness that is going to become a barrier to your goal, go after it aggressively early. Mm -hmm. And I, this is the funny part. I was terrified of public speaking <laughs> in, a, in my 20s. I could write the world's greatest paper. I could write the world's greatest speech for someone else to give. I would not open my mouth. Oh. And I had a mentor, a tough love kind of guy, and he said, Michelle, you are going to you know, torpedo your own career. You have got to get over this. <laughs> How and, did you do that? And I will help you. So we're going to do crawl, walk, run. You know, we're going to, you are doing great work. Instead of giving it to me to present, you're going to start with your peers at a brown bag lunch, and you're going to pre present your work. Good for him. And then now I'm going to, now you're going to do it in front of the larger staff. Next, you're going to go to this round table. Next, and by the end of the process, he was like, you're presenting at international conferences. Mm -hmm. So um, I was lucky. I had someone who like really pushed me to address a fear it's and a weakness early, because if I had not addressed it, I would not have been able to do the jobs that I had to do and, and wanted to do. Of course, so. Jesse, if you decide to become a lawyer, then all bets are off. The yeah. policy experts like Michelle learn more and more about less and less, and we lawyers learn less and less about more and more. So you don't have to go deep. Uh, next. Natasha. Thank you. Um, my name is Natasha Spreadborough. I am a Tua Emery Law, and I was an intern here at the Senate last summer. Um, so I wanted to first reiterate all of the thanks for coming and speaking with us. This has been fascinating. My question is about, it's kind of two-part, about the U.S.'s reputation abroad, but also a little about... Can what you speak a little more slowly? I'm so having sorry. With the microphone, I'm having trouble. You also, my accent. Things. I know no, that this right. is a problem for people. The first part is... Um, we, you, t you touched a little bit on like fascist and autocratic trends. Yes. Um, and so my question is about the U.S.'s reputation abroad with regards to these issues, partly how the global community sees the U.S., but also partly how the no these trends existing here have normalized similar trends abroad. And for instance, in my own country, uh, I don't want to say exactly an inspiration, but I think certainly have helped those kind of things grow, both with the normalization, but also with direct ties, like for instance, Nigel Farage being so close to this government. Yeah. Yeah. So. I guess my question is, in the future, how can uh, future administrations or the, the, the community here generally counter that reputation and also kind of counter those global trends without uh, directly interfering in other countries? Yeah. Thank you. No, it's a great question, and I'm going to try to answer this analytically without being horribly partisan. Um, but I do think that um, we, we have our, uh, a leader currently who, in his own political re rhetoric and his own style of governing, um, is outside the bipartisan norm, historically, in my view. Um, that it's not just about policy differences, it's about um, operating um, in a way that does not 
you know, align with the traditional norms of the presidency, that doesn't separate the, the White House from the functioning of the Justice Department, the functioning of the military justice system. Um, the soft separation of powers. Right. That is deeply disrespectful of the Congress as an institution that has taken numerous, made numerous statements that, and taken actions to politicize the court. I mean, so I, th I do feel that our institutions are under assault. Um, and I think that, you know, that we can't ignore that fact. That is now part of the American image, legacy, how the world views us. I do, I personally believe that if that assault is limited to four years, it's a lot better than if it becomes eight. <laughs> um, but even, I've taught, had this, I'm always asking my friends in allied countries, you know, if we course correct, if you had a president come in and just be all about restoring norms, restoring civility in our public discourse, restoring respect for institutions, reinforcing, <coughs> even reigning in executive power to strengthen the other institutions and restore yeah. balance. Would they believe us? I mean, would, how, would they take that? Okay, finally, America's back to itself. They've come to our senses. But what I worry that several people have said, you know, in the back of our minds, it's still, Trump was not, this president was not, is not just an individual. He is the product of a set of trends and developments within this country. And so even if you had a reset, they're still in the back of their mind worrying that, well, in the next four years, are we going to have the other flavor? So I do think that most people I've talked to said, look, this is a generational project now. If you're going to try to restore America's reputation as anti-authoritarian, anti-fascist, you know, the, the best model of democracy on the planet. It's going to take a lot of time and a lot of effort. Do I think that is absolutely the most important thing we should do? And no matter how hard it is, absolutely. I think our, I, I think our future depends on that. We have another question. Oh, right here. OK. Microphone down here. My name is Joe Lincoln. Um, in the context of what you were just discussing, I was wondering if you could discuss um, the likelihood of proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, beyond even I, uh, North Korea and Iran, given what's happened to the Ukraine, which gave up its weapons, uh, the situation with South Korea, with Japan, with Germany, uh, not being able to depend mm -hmm. on the U.S. as a, as a permanent ally. You know, I think that um, you're right that the, the proliferation calculus of other countries, particularly our friends and our allies, is very much affected by their level of confidence in our extended deterrence, that we will extend our nuclear deterrent to cover them as allies. Um, I think that that, has, that confidence is has been shaken in the case of Japan and South Korea in the sense that they are having a public debate or an elite debate about this. I do not think it's been shaken to the point where those voices that call for indigenous nuclear weapons have got the upper hand. Well, we could get there. I mean, so they're having discussions they didn't have before. I don't think the, those who argue for indigenous nuclear weapons are winning. Yet, so that's something to watch. Um, I don't hear that in Germany, um, and I do hear it in Saudi Arabia, because so Iran, if Iran actually went nuclear, produced a nuclear weapons arsenal, which they have not done so far, the JCPOA, the agreement actually made it put time on the clock. We removed weapons material, we limited enrichment, we did all kinds of things. Now that that is starting to fall apart, within a year or so they could be back in a, you know, a year or two, they could be back in a, a dangerous situation. At that point, you can count on countries like Saudi Arabia to, to say, okay, 
either I'm going to rent a nuclear weapon from Pakistan <laughs> or I'm going to find a way to rent the scientists I need to develop my own. So you could see a wave of additional proliferation from um, Pakistan, I'm sorry, from Iran. I think the other danger is North Korea, both because every system that's developed in the past, every advanced system, it is used, is sold to get hard currency. So we always have to be careful about watching, you know, whether they proliferate materials. Um, but if you ever had uh, either a conflict with North Korea or a collapse of North Korea, you have a large nuclear arsenal in an ungoverned space. And you can imagine anybody who's interested is going to be flocking there. And you have a very dangerous situation with both South Korean, American, and Chinese forces trying to get to those facilities to secure things. So that's a pretty nightmare. And in fact, our next well. major conference is on communication and threat escalation in the nuclear age. So we were Very dealing. important issue. I want to <laughs> give um, Paul or, or Heather Haga the opportunity to ask the last question or uh, make a few, say a few words. And Quick question. Can you, um, Center uh, for a New American Security is fascinating. And I know you're very involved. Can you just give us a couple of seconds and sure. what you do? So CNAS was started in 2007 um, because we really thought Washington needed another think tank. And people that, <laughs> no, I mean, I've never had people tell, so many people tell me, don't do this, you're crazy, you're at the premier think tank, why are you leaving, why are you starting, this? like, Washington. But we actually did find a different formula. And the formula is this, number one, lived bipartisanship. I mean, actually have Republicans and Democrats or independents or non-declareds on the staff, working side by side. Everything we do is bipartisan people, nonpartisan product, right? right. Like, so, um, and oh, by the way, when you create that space, that's a very safe space for the military to engage and to have the civil military dialogue. So that was design one. Design principle two was go to the pain. When I was at another think tank that I shall not be mentioned, it was the height of the Iraq War. Um, you had people who were against the war like me. You had people who had voted for it. But um, the truth was we weren't winning. And the question was, how do we turn this around and responsibly exit? Um, I wanted to write that report. I was told I can't write that report because it would either offend the Republicans on the board or the Democrats on the board. It was a losing proposition. Don't do it. So we came to CNAS, and guess what the first report we wrote was? That was <laughs> like, we go to the pain. It, I don't care how politically controversial, if it is a central national security issue that needs to be solved, that's where we go. And you know we don't worry about the polit politics of it. We don't let that stop us. Um, the third was um, the, as important as producing the policy reports is growing the next generation. And in most think tanks around town, um, I mean, this is a little exaggerated. I shouldn't say, um, I'll, I'll be, tone it down. Young people are interchangeable sort of cogs in the machine. Um, they don't get bylines on what they write. They don't get training to do media. They don't get to publish their own reports because they're seen as too high risk, not advanced enough to have their names out there under the banner of the think tank. We turn that on its head. Every intern, every RA doesn't leave to the center without publishing. Mm. We give them media training. We give them op-ed training. We, there's a career path where you can go from intern to senior fellow at CNAS. Mm. And so the whole idea is the pro, one of the pro, we have next generation leadership programs. The whole idea is as much as we are producing policy recommendations for the policy member, we are also producing the people who will be the cadre, and we're, we're creating futures. Um, and and that's, that's, I think, that's my little sales pitch on CNAS. Really? It's, I, it's, it's like my fourth child, so I'm, and very, I'm, really I'm very proud of it, and I'm very attached to it. Pleased so. to say that, in fact, Cyril will be doing a program, I didn't have a chance to tell you this, with CNAS Great. in the fall Excellent. Um, on uh, election security. Great. So And it'll be actually at CNAS, Wonderful. so we're very excited to be partnering. That's great well, I'd like to thank you so much for these uh, fascinating remarks. Uh, you are definitely a
woman driving change in national security. <laughs> and to thank Heather and Paul Haga and to thank say you. how honored thank we are. And, and we thank hope you. to have you back again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.